But good morning. How's everybody doing today? Great. great. Right on. Is there, I'm great. I'm doing well. That's very polite. We got somebody who's taught some manners in their family. Yeah. Is there a more complicated word in our language than family? Maybe, maybe a better question. Is there a word that just is accompanied with more baggage than family, right? There, there are people that you love to be around sometimes. There are sometimes people that you hate to be around sometimes. And then sometimes it's all that in between, right? Family can be really tough. You can be in a family that, that you really are close, thick as thieves. And you can be in a family that's really disjointed and dysfunctional. And you can be in one of those families that, that wants everybody to think that they're thick as thieves, but they're really dysfunctional. And so there's just kind of a dissonance that happens between the two. Family's tough. Family's important though. It's really important. You know, I think it's interesting. Uh, we apply, despite the fact that we have such an interesting love-hate relationship with family, with the word or the concept, uh, we apply that word to other places. So like at work, you'll hear your supervisor or your boss talk about, here at this company, we're a family, which I've heard it said, if somebody says that, you should probably not work there, but <laughs> we're a family here. Or like you talk about your friends is like, this is my real family. These are the, this is the family that I've chosen, Right? But it's interesting that we don't take, we export the concept of family out rather than importing the concept of friend or work into the family. It shows you the value of family. We understand that having this core sort of nuclear group around you, this community that's, that's thicker than, than any kind of commitment, we understand that that's really important. And because of that, that can do a lot of damage to us as well, right? It can hurt us. Who's in your family? Some of the deepest wounds are, we have probably have come from our family. So what I want us to do is I want us to look at Hebrews chapter two. And we're gonna look at this passage. And this passage is not specifically about family in the, in the way that we think of. It is about God's family. It's about how God's family came to be about. And we're gonna be in Hebrews chapter two, verses five through 18. And I wanna talk about how Jesus is gonna give us a better picture of family by showing us what his family is like what the divine family is like, what we've been invited into by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And the first thing that he's gonna give us is he's gonna give us a better family culture. He's gonna give us a better family culture. Look at verse five. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. So the author of Hebrews is continuing on in his discussion about Jesus is better than angels. Now, does anybody remember what last week, what the argument was? Jesus is better than angels because of why? Okay, so last week... We talked about Jesus is better than angels because he's divine. His nature is different than angels. He's not created. He is the creator. But interestingly enough, this week, Jesus is greater than angels because he's human. Now, you might be like, hold on, Travis. Angels? Humans? Aren't hu angels more powerful than us? They're super mysterious. I read those Frank Peretti novels way back in the day, and like they were super powerful in those books. Angels are scary. Have you read Ezekiel? They've got wheels and eyes and all sorts of stuff. How are we greater than angels? Well, to support this, he starts talking about human beings and he talks about the dignity and the glory that they have. First, he says that we're going to be rulers over the age to come. Now, this is really interesting. The age to come was begun by Jesus' resurrection. It'll be consummated, it'll be finished by Jesus' return and the new heaven and the new earth. And so in this new era, human beings are, are, are to, to co-reign with Christ, okay? There's some people that believe in the Old Testament, the world was ruled by angels, like angels were over specific kingdoms. And you see this a little bit in Daniel. You'll hear them talk about like the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece. 
And it's this idea that these angels, these supernatural, de- uh, uh, not deities, these supernatural beings are, are kind of in charge of the different portions of the world. But in the new heavens, in the new earth, we will be in charge. And it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that we will judge angels. So the scriptures are pretty consistent here. But then he moves into quoting Psalm 8. And Psalm 8's a really fascinating uh, psalm because David is talking about how great and how beautiful creation is. And then he starts looking at people and he starts becoming even more mesmerized. So let's talk about it. What I want to do is I want to look at this short passage, this quotation that he gives us from Psalm 8. And I want to see what is the culture of God's family? What is God's family culture based on this passage? And the first one is that God loves us. God cares for us. Look at verse six. Verse six. It's been testified somewhere. What is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? I like how he says it's been testified somewhere. It's like a college student that wrote it the night before. And he's like, I know I read this somewhere, but I don't remember the quotation. Verse six is telling us that he is dumbfounded by God's creation of humanity. And not just that, that he seems to be super invested in us. What are human beings? What are we? You look at the, he starts Psalm 8 by looking at the heavens and, and the, the sun and the moon and all this glorious stuff. I was talking to TJ earlier and they have a, a telescope and he was talking about all the different things that they were looking at in the skies, all these glorious things. And then he looks at human beings and he's like, and what are we? We're just like hunks of meat. Who cares? Why is God so invested in us when there's this giant ball in the, in the, in the sky that burns at millions of degrees? for thousands, millions of years. Why? What, what? Why does he bother with us? God has mercy on us. He cares for us. It says, why do you care for us? The word there in Hebrew in, in Psalm 8 is visit us. Why do you visit us? The word visit, you've read it this week. If you've been doing our dwell readings in Exodus, God visits his people to rescue them from slavery. The idea of visit is God coming close. It's also used when it talks about him punishing Israel. So it's not necessarily a, uh, we wouldn't think necessarily a positive thing, but it's always an investment, an idea of investment. God is close to us. He's invested in our well-being. Secondly, he gives us significance and value. Verse seven, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. Everybody has Dignity. This idea of of a crown is something that will be offered in reward for something that you've done. Okay, so so remember the the Olympic Games, the original Olympic Games, uh, when the Greeks would when you would win one of them, they would put a wreath uh, of of an olive tree on your head. You'd be crowned as the victor, right? You might be crowned as as a great warrior, a prince, right? The idea is you've earned something, but in this passage, we haven't done anything to earn it. And this is, what, uh, this is what the writer's telling us. We haven't done anything to earn this. God just grants us this crown, this crown of glory. He says that we have dignity and honor and worth. And that's something that goes along with kind of the way our culture is. Our culture says that every human being intrinsically has value, worth, and significance. Christianity would argue you're half right. Everyone does have value, worth, and significance, but it's not intrinsic. It's extrinsic. We have value, worth, and significance because God says we do. And we just sang about it. God's speaking things into existence. God speaking things. When God speaks something, it's true. He can't lie. So we have value and worth and significance because God has said we do, which means that that doesn't change. So if you're having a bad week or a bad year or a bad life, it doesn't matter. God says you're valuable. It's not something you have to drum up out of yourself. It's much more secure than intrinsic value. Much more secure. Lastly, we've been given a role to play. Look at verse eight. Putting everything in subjection under his feet. Everything's been placed under our feet. This is from Genesis 126, this idea. Human beings were created in the image of God to rule and reign over creation. And this idea of ruling and reigning is this idea of creation care, So everything is supposed to flourish under our leadership. We're God's vice regents. God's created everything. He's placed us in the world so that we will take care of everything. We're supposed to steward creation. We're supposed to make everything work. But there's a problem. What's the problem? 
Genesis 3 is the problem. That's the first time in human history that human beings take creation and exploit it for their own selfish gains. And we continue to do this. Are the resources of the world there for us to use? Absolutely. But do we use them too much? Do we abuse it? Do we exploit it? Yes, we do. And if you don't agree with me, guess what? There's an entire environmental protection agency. Why would that exist if we didn't exhaust the environment? If we have this tendency. But creation care isn't just tree-hugging environmentalism. Don't worry. Creation care is also caring for somebody else. They are God's creation. So the way we treat other people is creation care. It is stewarding God's creation. It is helping somebody else flourish. The way you treat yourself is also creation care. A lot of us treat this uh, body as something to be used up and discarded. So we work really hard, we don't sleep very well, we eat all sorts of things, we drink all sorts of things, we do things to our bodies, we don't take care of it. Not that we should worship it or, or anything like that, but the way you treat yourself, the way you treat the person that looks back at you in the mirror has a lot of impact on creation care because you are created. And this is the better family that God offers us a family where God loves us unconditionally, where everybody has value and worth, and everybody has a job to do. Everybody has something to contribute to the greater good of the family. And I promise you, if you point me to a family that loves one another well, particularly unconditionally because God loves them, treats one another with value and respect, and everybody has an important part of important contribution to life, that is a healthy family. If something is missing from that group, or if all three are missing, that's a dysfunctional family. That's a dysfunctional workplace. That's a dysfunctional relationship. And I guarantee you, if you were to tell me about what your childhood was like, I can tell you what part of your family was missing. If you grew up in a home, let's say that you grew up in a home where uh, didn't have love and didn't have value added each person, but everybody had a role to play, you grew up in a family where your value and worth came from what you brought to the table. So you either helped with your siblings or you helped around with chores in the house or as soon as you could work, you got out or your contributions were, uh, were playing a sport that everybody was proud of. That's your value and your worth. Your significance came from your contributions to the family. If you grew up in a family where, uh, where there was a lot of love, but there wasn't a lot of value or a role to play, then you've grown up and now you don't understand why people have expectations of you. You don't understand why, why you can't handle the demands of society. Everybody's just supposed to love me. If you grew up in a family that was all about dignity, but didn't have love and didn't have a role to play, you grew up in a family that the, the entire house, the entire family could be burning down behind closed doors, but nobody would ever know about it because you're not allowed to d bring disgrace to the family name. The whole thing could be burning down and you're like, mm -mm, not gonna talk about it. Maybe you were told as a kid, we don't do that here. That's not the, the, the way we do things in our family. They might use the last name. That's not the Smith way of doing. That's not the Johnson way of doing things. And when we get those things out of whack, out of proportion, that's when our families become dysfunctional because they're not emulating the, the family of God, the family that he's set up. So how do we fix that? Well, one of the ways that family gets better you should get better family members, <laughs> right? So let's find a better family member. Let's talk about a better sibling. Let's talk about a better sibling. Verse nine, but we see him for who, a little, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Pay attention to that perfect through suffering. That's important. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. I think verse nine, those first few words there is the most beautiful part of the passage because it says 
He's talking about humanity. The first few verses that we've just been talking about, it's all about humanity. And it talks about everything being in subjection to our feet, but we don't really see that. We see the disaster and the destruction that our relationships are, our relationship with the planet, all this stuff, everything's out of whack. And so we're like, we don't really see this, but we see him. We see Christ. That's who we see. Jesus is the perfect human. Jesus is the one who's actually here to do all the things that we weren't able to do. He's the one that's here to love unconditionally. He's the one that's here to fulfill the role that we couldn't fulfill. He's the one that's here and giving value and worth to everybody, no matter what they contribute. Now, this is great. It's great news. There's just one problem. That doesn't get us out of the, out of the bind that we're in. That doesn't change the fact that we failed. It just means that somebody's here to do a better job. So we can easily just be cast off and somebody else can do the job. That doesn't rescue us. Did you ever have a, a, an older sibling? Let's say you struggled in, in, a, in a subject in, in school. Mine was math. And you had an older sibling that would tell you the answer on your homework, even though they were supposed to help you. But they would just tell you the answer so they could go back to doing what they were doing. And then when you got to the test, you were like, I don't know how to do this. I got no clue. Anybody else? Anybody? Okay, nobody in the first hour had this issue either. And I'm apparently the only one that did. <laughs> Are all of y'all just mathletes and I'm, I'm the dumb one? That's fine. I'll deal with it. There'll be another question I'll ask you later, and you will respond to that one, I promise. <laughs> and so you just, you just, it didn't help you. And so if Jesus was just here to give us the answers, that doesn't help us. He's got to rescue and redeem us. And this is why it says that he tasted death for everyone. Every single horrible thing about death, Jesus tasted. Why do you think that when Jesus was here... Why didn't Jesus just live to be a ripe old age, die quietly in his sleep one night surrounded by friends and family? Doesn't that sound nice? That's the way to go, right? At least that's what everybody says. Unless you're a Viking, that's not the way to go. But how does Jesus go? Jesus dies in the prime of his life, abandoned by his friends, abandoned by most of his family. They thought he was crazy. I think his mom was there. And he's, his reputation is just destroyed and he's violently killed, violently killed, the worst way possible to die. He technically suffocates to death. He tastes and experiences everything about death for us. This is what it means in verse 10 when it says he had to be made perfect. You think, Travis, Jesus is perfect. I know he's perfect. They taught me he was perfect in Sunday school. What do you mean he's not perfect? It's a different kind of perfect here. It's not moral perfection we're talking about. You know when you're working on like a project and you need a tool and you need just the right tool, like you, you need to get a bolt off and, and, and you, your, your wrench is too big, so you got a different, you need the perfect size wrench. All the other wrenches are disqualified because they don't fit. Jesus' suffering allows us to pay the penalty for our sin, for our failures. And so he's made perfect by going through the suffering. If he doesn't go through the suffering, then that doesn't rescue us. That's what his, uh, it doesn't mean perfection again morally, it means perfect in, in application, okay? F.F. Bruce says that the pathway of perf perfection needed to be found by the pathfinder. He couldn't be our savior if he doesn't suffer. But what happens next is really neat. He becomes our brother. Look back again at verse 11, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. So we're brothers with Jesus in two ways, okay? Brothers and sisters of Jesus in two ways. One, it says we have the same source. Now, what does that mean? So God the Father, we're going to get in high theology here. You already put your Trinitarianism hats on. God the Father did not create God the Son. That's a heresy. But it does say that Jesus was begotten, right? So he's eternally begotten by God the Father. The Son is eternally begotten. He eternally proceeds from the Father, and he eternally submits to the Father. Now, if you want me to explain it beyond that, we do not have time. And it's always best to sit, stick with the safe language of the creed. So that's where we're going to camp out for right now. We are created by God the Father. So we are brothers in that we find our source in the same person of the Godhead, essentially, is, is the way it's being said. But we're also brothers in that Jesus 
has died for us. He has shed his blood for us. So now we're blood relations. We, we have the blood of Christ to make us a blood relation. And what's really great about this passage is we're family and we don't get left behind. He's not ashamed to call us brothers. And you might say, well, Travis, you don't understand. There's, my family is all about shame. We're ashamed of each other. They're ashamed of me. I'm ashamed of them. You don't understand how it works. This isn't the best example. Let's talk about shame in a family. Did you ever have an older sibling? You can tell I was the youngest. <laughs> I hope my brother doesn't listen to this one. Did you ever have an, uh, an older sibling that was very obviously embarrassed of you? You know, they were older, they were cooler. Uh, they didn't want anybody to know you existed, you know. They would take you places because mom and dad made them. They might walk like 100 feet in front of you so that nobody would see y'all together. You know, would you ever have a sibling that was ashamed of you? Wow, okay, I, none, no one? Thank you, thank you. Appreciate the honesty. We're friends now. But what's funny about them being ashamed, most of us were not like bring shame to the family name kind of shame. We might've been immature, might've been a little weird, you know, whatever, goofy. And especially once you found out that your older sibling was embarrassed of you, Man, that was like moth to a flame. You would just start doing stuff to be even more embarrassing. It was great. I still want to do that. I'm going to be honest. But you didn't do anything to like really discredit the family name. You were just kind of young and an oddball. But in God's family, we have brought so much shame to the name of God. We have brought so much discredit to the name of God. And if you don't believe me, do any of you know people who are not Christians because of Christians? They're like, Jesus sounds cool, but Christians, blech. They're judgmental. They're rude. They don't vote like I vote, whatever. We have brought a great deal of shame. And you know what's really cool? Jesus is not embarrassed of us. He's not ashamed of us. He doesn't want to hide us away. He wants to display us. He wants to show us. He loves us. He cares deeply for us. He wants to include us. He's not embarrassed. There's a baseball player. His name's Jock Peterson. Uh, he played for the Dodgers. He plays for the Giants now. He spent half a season with the Braves when they won their World Series a couple years ago. And I just had to get that in there. And uh, he's this like super gregarious, outgoing athlete, multimillionaire, very good at his job and, and the life of the party. And he's a brother who has Down syndrome. And it would be very easy for him to go on with his life and just ignore this part of his family. But he doesn't. He includes him. He brings him to the clubhouse. All the other players know and love Jock's brother. He includes him. He brings him with him everywhere. He's a part of the team. He's a part of that family. Jock hasn't abandoned him. And Jesus won't do that to us either. He doesn't abandon us. He loves us. He cares for us. He cares for you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed of you. He's been human. He is human. Still, to this day, he's human. That's one of the things we mess up. We think Jesus goes to heaven and he stops being human. Jesus is a human being for the rest of eternity. He knows what it's like to be us. He knows what it's like to have this weak flesh. He knows what it's like to struggle. And so when we're ashamed of people in our family, what does that say about our God? What does that say about our Christ? When you have an older sibling that dotes on you, that loves you, that cares for you, that does so many things for you, what is the one thing you want in the world? You want to be just like them. You worship the ground they walk on. You want to be just like Jesus. And that's, that's the goal of sanctification. We are supposed to grow in salvation to the point that we become just like Jesus. So how do you know if you're becoming like Jesus? There's two things. One, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I usually forget faithfulness and that makes me nervous. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. So if you're displaying those, and not because you're working on them, but because God's producing that in you as you're growing closer to Jesus, you know you're on the right path. The other thing I would say is do your relationships, your family, your work, your friends, whatever, do they display the divine family characteristics? Unconditional love, worth and value for each person and valuing whatever contributions anybody brings to the table. 
If those are hallmarks of your relationship, you're growing in Christ. You're, you're displaying the family characteristics. You're looking like the better sibling. But if that's not what marks your, your relationships, you need to turn to the Lord. You need to talk to him. You need to confess. And it's worth sticking around in the family. Because there's a good inheritance coming. There's a better inheritance. Inheritance is a part of family. And there's a better one for us. The final portion of this chapter, chapter two, talks about what Jesus' sacrifice has won for us. Now, I was very discouraged to learn that apparently lawyers don't read wills in boardrooms anymore to people. It's like really dramatic on TV, but apparently that doesn't happen anymore. Am I right? It's really discouraging. I think you can make some great reality TV, especially if there was like somebody that thought they were getting something and they're not getting anything. Like the camera can like super zoom in on them. That's so sad, but no. Imagine being at a will reading and you're, you're there and one sibling gets everything. Everything. Nothing. You're not even mentioned. That's what it's like in our family with God. Jesus receives everything. But you know what Jesus does? He says, I'm gonna share it with my brothers and sisters. We're gonna divide up the inheritance we're going to divide up the inheritance. So what do we get? What does the will say? Well, verse 14 says we've inherited life. Verse 14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who is the power of death, that is the devil. Death apparently rules and reigns right now. We know this. But there is no need to fear death anymore. Death has been conquered. Death is the last enemy to be defeated in 1 Corinthians 15. You've been given the gift of life through Jesus Christ. Whatever death haunts you, maybe there's a death in your life that haunts you or a grief. Maybe it's the death of a dream. It doesn't have to be the death of a person. It's the loss of something else. Whatever death chases after you, you don't have to live in its shadow, right? You don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to look to the future and be like, I don't know what that's going to be like. Sure, it's scary, I guess. But we have the one who's defeated and conquered death. You don't have to be afraid. Uh, you don't have to look at death as a way out. So if you're contemplating hurting yourself, suicide, that's not the way out. Death is not the way out. Jesus has conquered that. He's closed that door. What about those of us who are sad that we didn't maybe say everything we wanted to say before someone passed or, or we did say something that we wish we hadn't? There's grace for that. There's forgiveness for that. Jesus has conquered death and everything that comes with it. You've inherited life. So all the grief, the pain, the suffering, the tragedy, the spoken, the unspoken things, that's been conquered in Christ. Death has been defeated. You've inherited life. You've also inherited freedom. Verse 15, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Do you know what a slave passes on to his children or her children? More slavery. Typically, slavery is inherited. But Jesus has rescued us. He set us free. And now he's passed on to something greater than slavery. We have freedom now. Freedom from addiction. Freedom from temptation. Freedom to love and affirm other peoples. You now, in your family, you don't have to be the insecure one. You don't have to worry that other people maybe got more credit or got doted on more than you do. You know why? Because you have the inheritance of Christ. You're free to be like, yeah, sure, they were the favorite. Who cares? Because God loves me. And my parents maybe weren't perfect. Shock. No one's is. You've inherited promises. Verse 16. For surely it is not to angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Abraham will receive promises of land, of descendants, of blessing. And Jesus is the, the one who receives that inheritance. He, he receives those promises. But now he shared it with us. And so we have promises of a new heaven and a new earth where we'll live eternally in resurrected bodies. We have friendship and fellowship with God. That's a promise that we've received. We've received righteousness by faith. These aren't things you see. These are promises that are given. We've been also inherited help. Look at verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We've inherited help or victory. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin and now he offers us help. 
He's walked through temptation. He understands how challenging it is. This whole passage is about help. In verse 14, he partook of the same things. He's there helping. In verse 15, he delivered. In 16, he helps twice. And in verse 17, he's a merciful high priest. In verse 18, he helps again. This whole paragraph is about assistance. Jesus wants to help you. If you want to go out today and you're like, man, I'm going to have a great family. I'm going to go and I'm going to love and I'm going to treat everybody with respect and dignity. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure everybody's role is just, just everybody's vow. Yeah, I give it to Wednesday. <laughs> and that's probably if I'm optimistic. Because you're not drawing on the grace and power of Jesus Christ. Every single person in this room, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a trust fund baby. There's a trust fund of grace and power for you to draw on. It's inexhaustible. You don't have to wait for it to mature. You don't have to mature to draw on it. In fact, a sign of maturity is that you draw on it. Jesus wants you to spend it. He wants you to spread grace everywhere. He wants you to spread his power everywhere. And so if you're going to set out and you're determined to make your family the best one ever, oh, Pastor Travis said this, we're going to do it, you're going to fail. But if you turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I've heard this and I can't do it. This is really hard. Guess what? You ask for his help. You ask for his assistance. You ask for his encouragement. Lord, I need your grace and I need to see how you work. And you know how you'll start seeing it work? There'll start being confession when you fail to live up to it. When you fail to love, you'll say, I'm sorry. When you fail to treat somebody with the value and worth that God says they have, you'll say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You'll start seeing forgiveness because that's the sign. That's, that's what happens. Jesus has given us a better family. But that doesn't mean that the families that we have, the relationships we have, whether it's work or friends or church or whatever, doesn't mean that those are worthless or bad. It just means we have an example to follow and we now have grace to draw on. Maybe you've never put your faith in Christ. Maybe that seems odd to you. Maybe you've never given yourself to him in that way. You've never uh, trusted him. You've never reached into that trust fund. Today's the day to do that. He died so that you could have access to it. Would you trust him instead of trying to trust in your own self? You can do that today. What we're going to do right now is family's a sensitive thing. It's for a lot of reasons. So we're going to have uh, our connect group leaders, some of our connect group leaders that, that work in our church and serve and, and teach and lead. Uh, they're going to come up to the front and you're just going to see them kind of up here. And uh, this is going to be a time of response and prayer. And you can pray at your seat. That's just fine. Uh, you can come up and receive prayer from one of the connect group leaders and just say, hey, our family needs a blessing or my friends need a blessing. They would love to pray for you or pray over you. Maybe you're the only person from your family here. Well, guess what? Jesus is the only member of his family appearing before the throne, representing us before God the Father. So you could represent your family before the throne of God and praying for them. That's just fine. Maybe you're engaged. Maybe you're starting a family. Maybe you're thinking about being in a family with somebody else. You're like, hey, we need to get prayer. Let's go. You can come up here and you can receive prayer. Just coming up here, nobody's going to think that, wow, they're super dysfunctional. They're going to get prayer. Guess what? We're all super dysfunctional and every single one of us needs to be up here. But if God so moves and leads you to come up here and receive prayer, I would encourage you to do that, okay? Connect group leaders, if you would, you can go ahead and come up and take your spot up here and then uh, we'll, we'll be ready to receive prayer.